is the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. Welcome back to the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. I'm Ashton Cohen. It is an absolute honor for me to welcome on the podcast a role model of mine. I've been listening to him since I was 15, 16 years old, so most of my life. He is one of the sharpest and wisest intellectuals in the public space, the host of the Dennis Prager radio show and the founder of the highly influential Prager U and the author of multiple books, including one I'm currently reading, The Rational Bible. Dennis, thank you so much for coming on. It's such a pleasure. Thank you, Ashton. So, you know, I've done close to 70 interviews at this point, and we speak a lot about policy and culture and financial news, geopolitics. Uh, haven't spoken all that much about religion. We've delved a little bit into anti-Semitism and radical Islam. That's something that my family and I have experienced. My mother's a refugee from Iran, but not as much about religion, partly because I think there's so much that I need to learn about it still. And it's something I've really come to appreciate as I reach my 20s, late 20s, early 30s. So I'd like to start off there. One of the quotes you often like to mention is from the British writer G.K. Chesterton, who said essentially that men or individuals who choose not to believe in God, they don't just believe in nothing, but they will believe or fall for anything. And I think it's such a profound statement because I think most people will admit we live in a country right now with a lot of lost souls. The stats bear this out. You have record number of teens and children attempting suicide, committing suicide. Same thing with adults. You have record number of people on SSRIs. You have teens and adults question the very essence of who they are. You know, I'm not a man, I'm a woman, I'm pansexual, I'm genderqueer, I'm two-spirited, non-binary lesbian. People at the same time also just get triggered, right? They, they get angry at, at, at the, the most tepid pushback to, to their worldview. And this is at a time when we're living in the most prosperous society in the West ever, pretty much better than 99.9% .9 of humans who have, who have ever lived. So there's obviously you know, multiple factors that probably play into a lot of these social degradations. But is it fair to draw a causal link between the decrease in religiosity in our society and some of these serious negative externalities we see in our society today? What percentage of the people who say men give birth are, is secular? And what percent is religious? That to me answers the question. Mm -hmm. Secular, a lot of secular people, of course, know that it is a gigantic lie that enters the realm of the absurd that men give birth. But uh, if, you, if you were going to draw any generalization, overwhelmingly the people who say men give birth are secular, and overwhelmingly the people who find it nonsense are religious. Why is that not dispositive? And the same held true for lockdowns. And mm -hmm. even though most priests, ministers, and rabbis were sheep, and nevertheless, whatever opposition you had to lockdowns, almost abs as absurd and as destructive as men give birth, came from within the religious community. If you want a take on reality that is responsible, you are much more likely to get it from a religious Jew or Christian than you are from a person devoid of any religious reference. Mm -hmm. That's not an opinion. That's e In other words, I'll put it as bluntly as I can. Either what I said is true or false. It's not a matter of do you agree with me. Either I lied to you and to your listeners and viewers, or I told the truth. One of the things you mentioned in, in the Rational Bible, which I thought was really interesting, I hadn't thought about before, was that you know the biblical text was one of the first doctrine where man was instructed not to worship nature, love nature, appreciate it, but it doesn't take priority over over God, over humans. And as we lose emphasis on Judeo-Christian principles, you see that people create these new religions, often per more pernicious ones, significantly more pernicious ones, without any chance of redemption, like you see in Christianity, for example, or Judaism. Look at wokeism. You could look at these people who are vandalizing fine art in these museums all over the world, thinking that they're going to save the planet or fix the weather by doing so. And you could say this is a worship of nature again. This is reverting back to a pagan mindset in a sense. Do you think that there's 
any way to shift the sentiment on that? What would be the most effective ways, given that so many of the institutions are, as you'd say, maybe extremely secular and opposed to any semblance of Judeo-Christian philosophy or values? My concern is, and has been my lifelong endeavor, I have said this for 40 years broadcasting, I have had one overwhelming message, that people understand the consequences of secularism. I have not tried to convince people uh, that God exists. I, of course, I believe God exists, but that has not been my endeavor. My endeavor has been to teach people the consequences of not believing God exists, the consequences of the death of, of God, as Nietzsche put it, in Western society. One of them is nature worship, as you just pointed out, as I point out from the beginning, the revolution of Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, God created nature was a break with every single religious system that had ever existed, where the gods were part of nature. In the Bible, Genesis 1-1, everything is turned upside down. God is not part of nature. God made nature. God made the sun and the moon to provide light for humanity, but the sun and the moon were gods in, ancient, uh, in the ancient world. In Egypt, where the Jews began their sojourn, the god was Ra, the sun god, and the sun is dismissed as, as a handmaiden of God to provide light for humanity. The, the, the revolution of the Bible is why I'm working for years on my Bible commentary, the rational, uh, the rational Bible, because if you read that, it is not possible to think that there is any reason for optimism with the death of the Judeo-Christian worldview. I remember hearing from you, there was a German writer, Heinrich, I believe, who yes, basically Heinrich said Heine. that, Heinrich Heine. Heinrich Heine, who essentially said, this is about 100 years before the Holocaust. I remember going to Berlin and seeing Heine. the description of him as well. And this, he basically said that if the Germans lose Christianity, there's going to be hell on earth, hell on earth, right? And this was a this was a secular Jew. Heine was a, Heine was a secular Jew. The greatest German poet was a secular Jew, and predicted exactly a hundred years before, if if this talisman, the cross, leaves Germany, you ain't seen nothing yet. You're going to see hell, as I said, hell on earth. The guy was a prophet. And he emphasized that he was a Jew only to, to make it clear that uh, he, was, he was not a Christian defending the importance of the cross. He was a Jew, and not even a believing Jew defending. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be religious. You could be an atheist and understand we're doomed because we have departed from the Judeo-Christian worldview, specifically this Bible. There are even religious people who don't understand this. Mm -hmm. That's been my job, to make people understand this. I'm very gratified that you picked up on that. When you look at what he said and the depravity that played out, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. Not, not many people talk about it. Not pe many people even know who he is. You mentioned that without God, there is no point to anything. Yeah, well, secular philosophers have... have have been unanimous until the present day when illogical thinking has even taken over uh, in philosophy. Uh, if, there, if there is no God, all we are are self-conscious pebbles. What, what are we if, if there is no God? If, we, we, if we're just part of nature, which is the secular view, you're here for this tiny, tiny, infinitesimally small period of time, and then forever you're not here, just, just like an animal, just like a, a flower. We're self-conscious tulips. That's all we are, if there is no God. So this is not proof that there is a God, but you have to be dishonest to deny our inconsequentiality if there is no God. We, we are pointless, self-conscious beings. I guess another way of putting it is what is, other than maybe a utilitarian perspective, what is the point of being moral, right? What's morality rooted in if not for a higher power? 
Oh, no. that, that's always been the argument. Again, I don't care if you're an atheist or an agnostic. You, you have to understand, if you're intellectually honest, that if ultimately there is no God, there is no absolute morality, and murder is only wrong because you think it is. But that doesn't make it wrong. It just means that that's your opinion about it. If there is no God, morality is a matter of opinion, period. People, people are so unused to thinking clearly or thinking against what they want to believe that they don't acknowledge this. But that's, of course, the case. And, and, and we're seeing it happen. The, the, the secular world isn't even reproducing itself. The, the belief in the importance of having children, let alone getting married, that's also dying. Everything is dying in front of our eyes, and then people are, are, are still refusing to put two and two together, that the abandonment of, of this book called the Bible has mm -hmm. caused these issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday, actually, who had been to North Korea multiple times, and I was telling him a story about how uh, this professor, he'd gone to North Korea, and he remarked on how these students, and these were the elite students, right, in Pyongyang, from the children of the of the elite in society in North Korea. And he was remarking about how, you know, they were kind of incapable of logic because they've been just fed so many lies their entire lives. They couldn't even make like a logical argument to, to, to back a, an opinion. And his remark to me was, well, I don't know if many people in the West <laughs> can say that right now. And that was kind of profound because it's like, you know, we're not doing such a great job ourselves these days. I mean, I'm a proud Westerner, but wokeism has destroyed our credibility, I think, in a lot of ways to then be able to have a moral high ground with respect to other countries. And, you know, you could just imagine some of them saying, oh, well, what's your idea of a good Western society? One where, you know, drag queens are twerking in front of five-year-old children, like that's the degradation that you want us to follow. And I think it really does hurt our, our moral standing. Do you think that this has also contributed to you know, polarization is a hot topic. Everyone says, you know, we're, we're more polarized than at any point in history since the Civil War. Do you buy the argument? I would say we're more polarized than during the Civil War. There was one issue that polarized Americans, slavery. But otherwise, they shared a lot of values. Left and right share no values. I, I don't mean a few values. I mean no values. Liberals and conservatives share almost every value. Liberals vote for the left. That is the single great calamity of our time. Liberals do not vote for liberal values. Liberals believe in free speech. Conservatives believe in free speech. Leftists do not. Liberals believe in racial integration. Conservatives believe in racial integration. Leftists believe in left-wing dormitories, left-wing graduation ceremonies left uh, uh, excuse me black uh, ceremonies uh, uh, in, at college and black dorms at college right segregation school again yeah yeah yes that that these are all leftists i can't think of a value left and right have in common i can think of many values that liberals do but but not leftists leftists hate israel liberals love israel uh, liberals liberals lo love america there's a liberal jew who uh, wrote god bless america no leftist would write God bless America today. They don't like mm -hmm. God and they don't like America. So right. they, they're only left with bless. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, one of the things about the, the polarization topic as well is, you know, people will often say, well, you know, the right has gone very far right and the left has gone far left. And I take issue with that because if you look at somebody like Trump versus Reagan, yes, Trump was more abrasive and unique in his rhetoric and, and said some things that are unbecoming of a president. But He's probably to the left of Reagan on some serious issues, right? Trade policy. He was elected on a gay marriage platform. If you look at the Democratic Party, forget about going back to the 80s, the early 2000s. I mean, it's unrecognizable from where it was then, right? Gone are the days where they would focus on labor issues. And now it's all about, like we said, these, these niche gender identity issues, these highly racialized politics. Men can get pregnant. You know, puberty blockers for children, open borders, depriving poor yeah. and working class people of reliable energy in order to fix the weather. Do you think that was inevitable? Like, what is the cause of that? And how did it happen so rapidly? Well, the question of rapidity is a tough one. There's, an, there's a saying uh, that they say in Hollywood, uh, 
something to the effect, this guy's in a 40-year overnight sensation. In other words, maybe the public only knows of him as of last year, but he's been working his tail off for 40 years. The left has been working its tail off for, for a century to uh, ruin every institution in America, from the university to kindergarten and medicine and television and the arts. You, everything the left touches, it destroys. I, I have said this for, for decades, and it is tragically true. I, on my show, I just did uh, a segment on the American Association of, of Pediatricians, how how unscientific and even mm -hmm. child-hating they became. They mm -hmm. ultimately sided with the teachers' unions in endorsing schools shutting down. Right. I can't think of a more harmful idiocy against children than not sending them to school. Mm -hmm. It's tied with putting masks on two-year-olds. It's tied with vaccinating mm -hmm. little kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, of course, they're all on board with cutting girls' breasts off if she says she's a boy. Right. So they have been working at ruining everything. When I was at Columbia in the 1970s, uh, I was taught that men and women are basically the same. It's gotten more pervasive and more radical, but the roots were there, and certainly mm -hmm. the anti-religious and anti-American roots have been there for a century. It, They're the same, but yet a five-year-old needs to transition right away or it's a, a risk to her own life, right? That's right. Yeah, better a live boy than a dead girl. Right, right, right. Why do you think they're so much better at taking over institutions in the right? A conservative is not interested in power. It's just doesn't animate us. We Basically, conservatives want to be left alone. I, I know so many conservatives because I'm so active in conservative circles. I don't know any who want to control other people's lives. Mm -hmm. and, and if you raise the abortion issue, it, 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 it's, it doesn't prove anything. You can always take an exception. And, and the belief is that that creature that the woman is carrying has a right mm -hmm. to live. Whichever position you take is a power position. One is power over the woman. One is power over the child. So it, it, power is not the issue. Mm -hmm. the, the left wants power, and we want to be left alone. That's why it's harder for conservatives to get elected. Elect me, you'll get fewer benefits because the government will be smaller. Whereas the leftist says, elect me, I'll give you more goodies. It's amazing that conservatives ever win an election, given that fact. It's certainly a hard thing to compete against, especially a lot of the left's ideology and basis for inflaming people's emotions and motivating them is is built on resentment and resentment is a extremely powerful you know it's like the most based human emotion and it's hard to compete with that so how do you compete with that well just to add add fuel to your fire i have said for a long time in america you get a ba uh in ingratitude an MA in ingratitude and a PhD in ingratitude. And ingrates are all angry and unhappy and mean. There's no good human who's an ingrate and there is no happy human who is an ingrate. And, and that is the basis of all leftism. Those of us who feel unbelievably grateful to have been born in America or to have come to America we're conservative. If you feel grateful to be an American, you're a conservative, or maybe even a liberal who votes for the left. But you, but that's why the anger you mentioned exists. They're ingrates. How has you traveled? I think we said about over 130 countries. Mm -hmm. Has that impacted your worldview at all? If so, how? And do you recommend other young people who have the ability to do so to do it? It's been one of the greatest things of my life, having been to so many countries. I started traveling at 18. I've gone abroad every single year except 2020. It was hard to go abroad in 2021, but I did. And I, I'm continuing to do so. Most of those countries I've been to a few times, not just once. I've been to 20 African countries. I've been to Antarctica. I can't, I can't tell you the benefits that it's brought to me. After about five years of going annually abroad, I said to my close friend, so I was about 23, I said, 
Joseph, this is my tentative conclusion about huma humanity. I have compassion and contempt. <laughs> and that's that was, it stuck with me. There's a lot of suffering and I have compassion for that. And there's a lot of bad stuff people do. And I have, uh, I have contempt for that. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you get, ideally you get a little more humble because you realize there are so many different avenues culturally to, to living a life. You're not the center of the world when you travel. They're the center of the world. It's a very healthy and beautiful thing to do. It, mm -hmm. it, it has had a big impact on yeah. Yeah, it has on me as well and it's something I recommend everyone do when they can. Well, they can. Yep. Yeah, yep, yeah, you know, and it's it's certainly going to be more it's more fulfilling than blowing a bunch of money on bottle service or going to bars and getting hammered. You know, you will learn so much about people. You learn and yourself. So you learn a lot about yourself. And yourself. Mm -hmm. And and you'll be incredibly appreciative, I think, of the country that yeah. you live in when you see how, how the rest right. of the world is like. I mean, even I was in Spain last year and Spain by world standards is a good country, you know, but but it has like fifty percent unemployment rate among people my age, and right. their their incomes are significantly lower. It's it's a much tougher, right. much lower, uh, you know. And that's one of the that's one of the great countries of the world, right? Like it's it's not right. Benin or, or Togo or something, right? Yeah, and I've been to Togo. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to South Africa in a few months, and that'll be my first first experience there. But it's honestly one of the things as well why I'm in favor of of at least legal immigration is because. The, the people who are going to be most appreciative are people like my parents who are immigrants, children of immigrants, much more so than some like white kid who like grew up in Santa Monica and was sheltered. You know, I, I think conservatives should, should realize that, you know, illegal immigration, different story. We need to control the border, all that for sure. But some of the most appreciative people you'll meet are people from immigrant families, immigrants themselves. What gives you most worry about the future of our country? Let's, let's project out the next 10 years or so. And what gives you most cause for hope? 40%, according to Pew and others, 40 to 50% of young Americans say they believe in freedom of, freedom of speech except for hate speech. Hmm. That's my biggest cause of worry. The, yeah. the most important freedom is free speech, and half yeah. of America's youth don't believe in it. And it shows how poorly they've been trained on thinking logically that they could say, I believe in free speech except for hate speech. It means I don't believe in free speech. They don't even understand the, the inherent fallacy of their, of their line. Either you believe in free speech. Listen, my column this week is that Holocaust deniers go to hell, literally. If they don't go to hell, there is no God. That, that's my actual title of my column. And yet I am not for banning Holocaust denial. It, I, my free speech even applies to about a, as evil a doctrine as you can hold. The, right. the, uh, so uh, what gives me hope is the staggering number of young people that I meet uh, who uh, hold these values. So young people give me the hope and young people make me pessimistic. And we'll leave off on that note. And I'll just say real quick as well, you know, you talk about even giving the worst people the freedom to speak. At least it's in front of us and we can all see it. Suppressing That's evil right. and pushing it underground yeah. has never worked out too well and letting it simmer. So, Mr. Prager, thank you so much. It's been such an honor to have you on. And where can thank people you. find more about you and, and listen to you? My first hope is that they read my books, especially the Rational Bible. It'll change the way they look at the world. There are three volumes out, Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy. Two more to go. And uh, you can watch my uh, weekly fireside chat. The young people in particular all over the world watch it. It's, uh, it's at PragerU. Just type in Prager Fireside Chat, my radio show. I hope that this kindles interest in what I have to say. So I thank you for having me. If you enjoyed our show, please click subscribe to stay up to date with our YouTube channel and podcast and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts so that we can keep delivering guys some great content. Thanks for listening and we will be back next week.
Bruh. We're going to talk about the issues that really matter. Our country, our economy, the Fed, QE, GDP, BTC, NFTs, AOC, the CCP, Cardi B, Ow. Yeezy, Yellow Socks, Iran, Joe Biden's dementia, Come on, man. and probably sex robots. We stand for a free and open debate and exchange of ideas. And if you disagree with anything we talk about, you are a racist and no better than Hitler. What? Let's get started.